there's something disrupting the endocrine system of these fish at a critical time in their development. And what is that something? And the problem with that question is there are so many possible pharmaceuticals and chemicals that we've created that we put on in all kinds of products that are passing through our wastewater treatment plants. They're chemicals that we probably have only recently been able to detect in our wastewater, in our rivers and lakes, because they're at such low concentrations that they're hard to measure, but potentially they are accumulating somewhere in the food chain and affecting these organisms. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. Clean water is essential to life. It nourishes, hydrates, and sustains us. We couldn't even live on this planet without it. Unfortunately, our water is more polluted than ever before. Man-made pharmaceutical drugs and chemicals are making their way into our drinking water at unprecedented levels. What's happening exactly and what can we do about it? This is episode 295 and our guest today is Carrie Jennings. Carrie has been a field geologist for over 24 years. She works currently with Freshwater, a leading public nonprofit dedicated to preserving freshwater resources and their surrounding watersheds. Today, Carrie explains how antibiotic use on farms, drugs that our neighbors may be taking like anti-inflammatories and antidepressants, and even what we throw away ends up contaminating our waters. She goes over the worst toxins dubbed forever chemicals, and she talks about how we can avoid them when making purchases. She also offers suggestions for what each of us can do to protect the quality of our water for our own health and the sake of everyone in our community. Before we get into the conversation, I want to share with you a gold mine of information that's easy to access and share. I'm not talking about the podcast this time. I'm talking about the fact that the Weston A. Price Foundation has 12 trifold brochures that cover a variety of topics from myths and truths about soy, nutrition for mental health, butter is better, how to protect against cancer with food, dangers of vegan and vegetarian diets, and so much more. These are great resources to get a handle on a variety of topics and to share with family and friends. So get our trifold pack, which is one of each brochure, for only $3 on our website. Just go to Order Materials. The link is in the show notes. That's at westonaprice.org. Oh, and at the end of every podcast episode, you may have noticed, we read a letter to the editor from our journal or a podcast review from Apple Podcasts. If you like the show, I would love to invite you to leave a review of your own. We are at about 950 reviews and we're trying to make it to 1,000. Help us close in on that milestone. It lets everybody know that the show is worth listening to. Just go to Apple Podcasts and click on the ratings and reviews. I'll even put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. And thank you in advance. This is Holistic Kelda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Carrie. Thank you, Hilda. I know you're in Minnesota, and you were saying something to me recently about how smallmouth bass have been affected in a river that runs through your particular city. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, this is a river everyone will have heard of. This is the Mississippi River. Its headwaters are in Minnesota, and it runs through our metropolitan area. It bisects the metropolitan area of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And that means that the cities get to enjoy those wonderful views and walks along the river, but they also take advantage of the flow of the river for their drinking water supply and their wastewater discharge. So the major wastewater treatment plant for the city is located on the river downstream of every major city. The problem is what the wastewater treatment plant does is kind of a gentle approach to water treatment. You kind of introduce oxygen to the water and you deal with the solids that float up to the surface and you encourage the beneficial organisms that can break down some of the pollutants. But we put a lot more pollutants in our river, in our bodies, in our waste than we ever have before. So some things are slipping through the treatment system, it seems. And they are potentially accumulating, or at least they're in a high enough level downstream of the Twin Cities, that they're affecting the fish population 
in kind of a slow reach of the river that we call a lake. It's Lake Pepin. And in that lake, 73% of the smallmouth bass that were sampled recently had both male and female parts. And that should just make you pause and stop and wonder a lot of things. But I'll just leave it at that right now. Oh, no. And I mean, I don't even know where to start. You're making you're right, it's making me pause. That sounds horrible. Are people aware of this? I don't know how widely aware they are. I think that people maybe are noticing changes in their ability to catch these fish, different abundances, that those are probably apparent to people that fish on these rivers and lakes. And this is not just in Minnesota. This is nationwide. However, this is kind of an extreme case. This seems to be a higher amount of this intersex fish that we are seeing. Other parts in the country, it looks like they're much smaller percentages. And I'm not sure why they're so high. It looks like nationally 33% of the smallmouth bass have male and female parts. So, I mean, that's observation. And then you start saying, what does this mean? And it might mean the collapse of a fish population if they can no longer breed. But it also means there's something disrupting the endocrine system of these fish at a critical time in their development. And what is that something? And the problem with that question is there are so many possible pharmaceuticals and chemicals that we've created that we put on in all kinds of products that are passing through our wastewater treatment plants. They're chemicals that we probably have only recently been able to detect in our wastewater, in our rivers and lakes, because they're at such low concentrations that they're hard to measure. But potentially they are accumulating somewhere in the food chain and affecting these organisms. Well, and then another question is, let's say you don't care that much about fish, which of course we should be paying attention to everything that's happening in our environment, especially to flora and fauna, because obviously that might be affecting us too. But that's what I was gonna ask you next is, are these toxins in the water that we're drinking? Yes, they are, because we are near the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And this river is used by many cities downstream between here and New Orleans as a drinking water source. It's a pretty reliable flow and it can be brought into a treatment plant. And usually surface water is treated more than if you're pumping it out of the ground because it's assumed that groundwater is a bit cleaner. But still the treatment of drinking water, it's a fairly old technology in most cities. It probably is just some kind of filtration, maybe charcoal activated reactions, probably not what you would hope, like reverse osmosis and ozone treatment. I mean, treatment to actually do every removal of every chemical. It's usually just trying to get rid of the things that we know cause disease, like bacteria and other contaminants that cause disease outbreaks. But can we break down for just a moment what is in the water exactly? (laughs) Like when they noticed what was happening to these fish, these smallmouth bass that are downstream of the city, I know you said it's a multitude of toxins, but what what kind of things are we talking about? Can we be specific? Well, they call them endocrine disrupting compounds. That's where I would start to look. And that can be anything from the birth control that women take that Pretty much, it's an artificial compound in most cases, and it passes through your body without much change and goes through the wastewater treatment system without much change. So I would start with those. They're going to certainly be the most active compounds from other mammals. I'm not sure. I'm not a biologist, but I'm not sure how they would affect different organisms. But you can also get endocrine-disrupting compounds that just kind of look like hormones. And you have probably heard of the plasticizer bisphenol A, And it looks like a hormone. And so it disrupts the endocrine system by being similar enough to be substituted. So there's so many of these, and we're just now trying to figure those out. And the other part is that our health departments really don't understand what the limits of exposure to these compounds should be. Right. And so they're hormone mimicking substances, right? Sure. And so obviously these are disrupting the fish's system. And likely, in all likelihood, they're disrupting ours as well. That is definitely the question that should be asked. And usually what we think about is at what level, what concentration would they have to be to start affecting humans as well? Or are they concentrated in something we do with water? It's definitely a concern. Not only do we consume low levels of these in our drinking water, 
but we most likely are getting other things like just imagine the drugs that people typically take, anti-inflammatories, anything that has to do with other pain relief or illicit drugs or antidepressants, chemotherapy drugs. Some very potent drugs go into our rivers through the wastewater treatment system. And then usually those solids that are removed are spread on the land. And so those are broadly applied and hopefully the bacteria in the soil are breaking those down and making those less toxic, but that's a hope. And we know from other sampling in the surface water in Minnesota done by the United States Geological Survey that we are seeing pharmaceuticals in our rivers and streams, even away from metropolitan areas. You know, what's interesting to me about this, Carrie, is that it seems that waste never really disappears. In other words, we put things in the trash or we put things in our bodies that come out and we think, okay, that's gone, flushed it away. But it doesn't really go completely away. It It doesn't leave the planet. It never goes away. And if I could get everyone to tour their city's landfill and their city's wastewater treatment plant, I think it would change a lot of people's behaviors. When I toured ours recently, and it's called the Pig's Eye Plant, it's located on Pig's Eye Lake, strange name. They were taking two dumpster loads of flushable wipes out every day. So those flushable wipes get caught up in their conveyor system and they have to remove them by screening them out initially. And then what do they do with those? They chuck them to a landfill and they spread them on the ground. Yeah, there is no away. You can't flush, you can't throw, you can't dispose of something. It is going to be somewhere in the environment and hopefully in a not very toxic place, but yeah, it's it's changed my behavior significantly. I was going to gonna say, tell us one way in which your behavior has changed since you're so aware of the fact that there is no away. Well, I certainly have much limited the new things that I purchase, and I try to use things up until they're gone. I try to use the least potent chemical that I can for any application like cleaning or brushing my teeth or washing my hair. I try to use something as close to a natural formula as possible. Water is a wonderful solvent. You can do a lot of cleaning just with water. And if you just add a little bit of something else like vinegar or baking soda, you can go a long way or an abrasive like Bonami cleaner, you know, for the sink. It's just an abrasive and a little bit of water with that just cleans the sink right up. You don't need bleach. You don't need antibiotics or antibacterials. Minnesota was the first state, in fact, to ban triclosan, the antibacterial that was common in soaps, and now it's banned nationwide. And that's something that those Mm -hmm. chemicals that were artificially created for something that are extra slippery or extra something that, you know, a material scientist came up with, there's probably a reason those don't exist naturally, and there's probably not a natural way for them to break down. Well, you're giving us a lot of food for thought. And you mentioned antibiotics a moment ago. I want to ask you about that. I know that we are trying to cut down on our antibiotic use because antibiotic-resistant bacteria then surge, and that can cause all kinds of problems. But I understand that antibiotics are also widely used for animals. Can you tell us about that and what the consequences of that might be even in our water systems? Yeah, that's true. We, from everything from honeybees to beef cattle, receives antibiotics. And that's usually because these organisms are being raised in a different way than the natural system. And when they're close Hold on, hold on. <laughs> honeybees? Honeybees, <laughs> honeybees. Yeah, they get a little tracheal mite. They get a little cough. They're susceptible to some diseases. You've probably heard about colony collapse disorder in honeybees. And one mm-hmm. of the things that beekeepers will do is put some antibiotics in the hive so that they can eat that as well as the pollen they're collecting and the honey they're storing. Yeah, I was very good friends with a beekeeper who did this. So, I mean, I'm I'm sure there are beekeepers that don't take this approach, but they get tetracycline or they have in the past. But in any case, so the bees are getting it. Yeah, but I think what we need to be concerned about is the larger animals that are getting lots of it and are getting it on a daily dose. And sometimes this daily dose is to help them gain weight quickly or to keep disease outbreaks from getting away from the farmer in a confinement operation. So they go into the animal and then they leave the animal through the urine and the feces, and then that is spread on the farm fields. And so I mentioned a little bit ago that the USGS was seeing some of these pharmaceuticals in streams that were far away from metropolitan areas. Well, now 
we've realized that a lot of it is coming from animal manure that is spread on the land as a crop amendment. You know, people think they're doing the good thing to return this organic matter with nitrogen and phosphorus to the soil, but coming with it is the pharmaceuticals that have been given to the animals. And it looks like the highest levels of antibiotic use is in these confinement animals. It much exceeds the volume of antibiotics given to people. And then does it end up in our water as well, on our land and then our water? Yes, exactly. So it ends up in the soil. And even when it's just in the soil, we can see that it significantly affects the microorganisms that are in the soil community. It reduces the number of microorganisms, and it also is the place where these antibiotic-resistant genes are probably starting to develop. And then that kind of goes into the streams from there. It does look like people that live within a certain distance, and it's a very, you know, like a mile or two of fields that are spread with manure, do have more antibiotic-resistant infections. And we should be afraid of that. We should be thinking about the health of the planet as one health. It is the health of the people, but it also is the health of the animals. It's the microorganisms in the soil. It's the creatures living in the water. And there is a kind of growing initiative to think about the planet that way as one healthy system. Right, because if we think of it as almost an object, right? If we think of the land as an object, it's like, well, it's ours to dominate and extricate what we need from it. And then we're not nurturing it and realizing and recognizing that our own future is tied to the health of this living rock that we're abiding on. That's right. I mean, the soil, just as that example, we know that soil fertility depends so much on what the community of organisms is that's living in the soil itself. They create the ability of that soil to soak up water and to store carbon and every aspect of the fertility to release the nitrogen to the plants is controlled by the microbiome in that soil profile. And there's just this growing awareness of how important that is and how we can really strip the land of its fertility by beating the life out of it with chemicals and just the conventional farming practices that we've been doing for the last 60 to 80 years. Coming up, Carrie explains what forever chemicals are and how we can avoid purchasing products that have them. And she also talks about how to advocate for clean water right where we live. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures is an amazing 155-year-old farm in Bluffton, Georgia. They pasture, raise, and hand butcher 10 species of livestock, all of which are available in their online store. Subscribe to their newsletter at whiteoakpastures.com to learn more about their educational workshops, virtual and in-person, and their internship program. They are doing things right. They are the only farm in the United States with scientific data that proves that their regenerative farming practices are producing carbon-negative products. Basically, this means that their cattle sequester more carbon in their lifetime than they emit in their entire lives. So when you buy from whiteoakpastures.com, you help the environment. So vote with your dollars for a production system that is good for the animals, good for the soil, and good for you. I've been to White Oak Pastures, and I can personally vouch for their quality and integrity. So head over to whiteoakpastures.com and get quality food and non-perishable items delivered straight to your door. Also, the Weston A. Price Foundation has a free info pack that gives you background on the foundation and offers you our most popular brochure, The Timeless Principles of Healthy Traditional Diets. Just go to westonaprice.org and click on the free info pack button. And in case you can't tell, we are committed to getting information to you on how to live your healthiest life any way we can, through the podcast, our journal, our website, private membership groups, etc. We use just about everything with the exception of skywriting, but we can try that too if you really want us to. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Yeah, and you know what? I've heard tell... Carrie, of a chemical that has been dubbed the forever chemical. What is that and what is it doing to us? Yeah, that takes us away from farming and more into just these chemicals that we've created kind of for our convenience. If you have flame retardant pajamas on your children or if you have 
scotch guarded your carpet or your couch because you didn't want stains to soak in, or if you have a nonstick pan, then you've been exposed to these chemicals. And these are PFOA, PFOS, and PFAS. That stands for per and polyfluorinated compounds. And let me just tell you that they're designed to be slippery and they're designed to be fireproof. They're in fact used at airports to kind of put out fires on runways. So in some places it feels like they're an essential thing. In other places they're just convenient, but they were created in such a way that they are slippery and impossible for organisms to get into the core of this compound and break it down. That's how they were designed, and they're really good at what being designed for that. And that means that they're persisting in the environment much forever, it seems. The other thing is that they can be found in the blood of almost anyone on the planet and any being on the planet, including polar bears in the Arctic. So somehow they're spreading. Wait. Yeah. Somehow how did they get that far? You know, they must be getting airborne at some point, perhaps mm -hmm. in the creation of these compounds. This is, you know, the 3M and DuPont and, you know, the places that make Teflon, the factories themselves can create the emissions, the waste that the factories discard in landfills. And they're getting into the surface water, the air, the groundwater, and they're not going away. At very low levels, they are carcinogenic. And this is a case where they are concentrated in the human body in breast milk. And in Minnesota, they have set the standard for exposure based on the exposure of an infant to the concentration in the mother's breast milk. So we have a fairly good and low standard for these. Unfortunately, we also have a significant part of our air metropolitan area that's contaminated with them. So we're currently working with money that was from a settlement with 3M out of court to find alternate water supply for some of these people that are impacted. Well, yes. And now I'm putting a lot of different pieces together because, as you know, on this show, we've interviewed a lot of different health experts, some of whom are very concerned about radiation. For example, if you live near an airport, <laughs> you know, you're going to have a high exposure as the planes are communicating to the tower and there's all of this messaging going back and forth. And I thought, well, that's problematic. I don't want to live near an airport. But now you're giving me another reason <laughs> not to live near an airport if they're using these PFAs or PFOAS or whatever. Yeah, the PFOS. firefighting foam. Yeah. And even small airports use these and they practice with them as well. You can probably find maps now of where this contamination is in a lot of the states that are most impacted. Michigan is another state that has a significant amount of impact. Minnesota for sure, because we're the home of 3M. But I would say that no one's exempt. And that, in fact, I've known about this for a long time. My son is 26, and I knew when I was pregnant that I should avoid certain things. And I don't know why the broader population didn't get that message not to use nonstick pans or Scotch Guard. And I've never put him in flame retardant pajamas. I don't know why people don't understand that or haven't heard that message. Well, I imagine the companies are all about keeping these products on the market because they're lucrative, right? Sounds good. I don't want my kid to get caught up in flames or something. Scotchgard is gone. You will not find that product anymore. Um, yeah. Well, that's a relief. And I remember putting my kids in T-shirts all the time and I thought, oh, I'm not being a good mom. They're just always wearing their dad's T-shirts for sleep. But I think in the end, it turned out okay. That's good. You know, another category of clothing that I avoid is the waterproof clothing. So anything that has been sprayed on the outside with the waterproofing and the same kind of thing that you would put on a suede boot or something, those are the same class of chemicals. Okay. So you've given us so much to think about, Carrie, and I don't want to get too discouraged <laughs> about the poisons that we're putting all around us. Seriously, what can we do to mitigate our exposure to pollutants and help those who are downstream from us in effect? I think every time you reach for a product on the grocery store shelf or the department store shelf or in the hardware store or in the pharmacy, think about whether or not you would want to drink that. Even water it down and drink it. If you look at the label of that and they are not telling you what chemicals in it, and they don't have to for non-food items, be suspicious of it. And if you are looking at a label and it has very explicit instructions of how to dispose of it, like wrap it in paper and don't let it get near fish and don't let it get near your dog. Don't put it on your grass. Be concerned because those are harsh chemicals. So if you don't understand what is making the 
toilet water blue when you put something in there or what you're spraying in your shower to make the water sheet off the walls of the shower. If you don't know how that's happening, if you don't know those chemical reactions, find another way to clean those things. A little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of a non-toxic abrasive like calcium carbonate is just, it's going to clean it just as fine. Don't look for the magic solution that's going to clean things, especially in a place where you're exposing your body and a lot of your skin area is exposed and the most vulnerable. And I would say that would be, you know, in a shower situation. So look for products that are natural, that have not been made with chemicals that we have created in the last decade or so. These are not as regulated as closely as you would think. Usually they're taken off the market once problems are recognized. And then pay attention to what your health department is doing. In Minnesota, we have a process where we can nominate chemicals of emerging concern or contaminants of emerging concern for critical evaluation by our health department. And they will dig into the literature and dig into the exposure limits to humans and set standards that will have to be complied to by the wastewater treatment plants and the drinking water treatment plants. So if your state's not doing that, have them look to other states that are a little farther ahead. The EPA does not necessarily lead on this, but it seems to be coming from some of the states where water is of higher priority and they have a little bit more money to spend on protecting the health of people that are using it. And then finally, I would say, if you do have concerns about anything from these endocrine disrupting compounds to the lead in your pipes, potentially treat your water before you drink it. I would always go with a treatment system as opposed to buying bottled water. You could potentially also drink distilled water, where a lot of these Mm -hmm. things have just been removed by, you know, making the water into steam and letting it recondense. But I have a reverse osmosis system on my house, and I know that people who are in the PFOA area in Minnesota rely on reverse osmosis and then also some charcoal filtration added after that. So treat it more than once and then serve it with confidence that you've removed all that you can. Carrie, you do speak so knowledgeably. Remind me how you got into this field. What piqued your interest about our water and our environment? Yeah, I have to admit that I'm not a chemist. I'm not a molecular biologist. I'm a geologist. And I spent the first 26 years of my career understanding the distribution of the geology of Minnesota. So I knew what the surface sediment was, how deep it was over the bedrock, where the water was held, how the water moved through the system, where erosion was happening. But as a result of mapping and driving every single mile, canoeing every river in half of the state, I really started to notice changes in the water and water quality and heard a lot of local concerns. And I saw places where the surface water had become unswimmable and unfishable. And that moved me into this part of my career, which is as research and policy director for a nonprofit in Minnesota that's dedicated to protecting our water for the future, groundwater and surface water. So freshwater has enabled me to kind of broaden my scientific understanding of water quality and quantity in Minnesota and also look for solutions. And these can be solutions that we put into law at the state level, or they might be solutions that we just convey to the public or some local levels of government so that they can act on their own behalf. So the other thing I like to think that geology has given me besides this broad landscape understanding is the sense of deep time. Geologists, I only study the last two million years of Earth history. I study the period that was primarily glaciated Actually, it may be three and a half million. I'll push it back to that. But the planet is 4.6 billion years old. And geologists think in those time scales. They think in hundreds of millions of years and major extinction events and how the whole planet can seemingly die off when a meteorite impacts it. But then a little bit of life survives and grows again to become a complex biological community. And we think in these big cycles I think that makes us a little calmer in the face of threats like we're seeing now, but it also Mm -hmm. means that we also see a planet that survives without us. We are so brief on this planet, people are. We haven't even been around for four million years. And we can see that the planet survived for a long time without us and it will go on. In some ways, I, I see what we're doing as 
a huge experiment with the planet that might end up having catastrophic consequences for our success, but that the planet will go on. Have you encountered skeptics who are like, you know what? Things will go on. And look at me. Like you're saying, oh, we've got this polluted water, but I drink it and I'm totally fine. Like, have you run into people like that? And what do you say to people who have a, let's just say a short term view of what's going on? I have definitely run into people with a very short term view. Like if their water makes good coffee, they're fine with it. (laughs) (laughs) And that's a specific example. (laughs) Or people that work in the gasoline industry that, you know, kind of like the smell of it and hold it up to their face. And we learn more about disease and impacts of the human body. And I think we're just figuring out some of these ways that we're making ourselves sick and depressed and obese. And a lot of it might be these low-level environmental contaminants. I guess you can't convince everybody, but I think those people that do care about their health will examine the information. How do you deal with the skeptic who says, I'm fine, we're fine, and maybe it's normal for this part of the river to get like that? Yeah, I think more than the skeptic, I feel like that would just be an individual decision and they're not impacting a lot of lives. But if that skeptic is one that holds office or if that skeptic is one that has influence locally on how the water's treated or the laws, then I would be concerned. Then I would work hard to convince at least those around that person that this is real, this is really happening. I think of more of a concern to me is not the skeptic, but the person that deliberately tries to confuse people And this might be a corporate entity that deliberately tries to obscure information or extract the most value out of a resource while endangering people. That is more concerning to me. It feels more evil. It feels like it's done with knowledge and intent. And that is also a harder battle. Mm Mm-hmm. It seems to me now is a time for us to open our eyes, and you've done a lot of that in this conversation, to what's going on around us and realize that we need to make small choices probably that will make a big impact on the long run. That's right. Small choices make a huge impact if done by the many. And, you know, we as scientists don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. And our views will change as we're able to measure and see things in the future. But I think simpler is better. The planet is limited in its ability to clean and filter water, and the planet is limited in just the other natural resources that we have. There is going to be a place where we will run out, and we already have run out of some things, or they've become so expensive that we can't use them anymore. There's going to be a helium crunch coming up. (laughs) It seems like it's something that we shouldn't run out of, but... It's such a light gas that it can escape the atmosphere and it's getting harder and harder. You can't create it. It's one of these Mm. things that are just part of our atmosphere. You can capture it and concentrate it, but you can't create helium. And so we're reaching peak helium. But I would say that in some places, we probably are reaching the limit of our ability to provide clean, safe drinking water. And water really and feels like that. it should, yeah, it feels like it should be a fundamental right, access to clean mm-hmm. water. We will have a transcript of this conversation so people can go back and look at some of the things you've mentioned. I think you've given us some practical tips already, Carrie, but I want to pose the question to you I often pose at the end. If the listener could do one thing to improve or protect their health, what would you recommend that they do? Get your water tested for just the common chemicals like arsenic or nitrate or some kind of a easy to measure contaminant that comes from human action. And if it's there, treat your water. Excellent advice. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really enlightening. You're welcome. Our guest today was Carrie Jennings. Go to freshwater.org for more information. And I'm Hilda Labrada-Gore. You can find me and learn about events that I'm planning and more on my website, holistichilda.com. And now for a review from Apple Podcasts. Essential for Health, Nutrition, and Holistic Living. Kay Johnson 903 says this, This podcast has been absolutely illuminating. What a source of truth in a time where it seems like everything is so corrupt. The Weston A. Price Foundation and the Wise Traditions Podcast has been an absolute lighthouse. My husband and I are so glad to have found this before having children, and we are now way more confident in an approach backed by ancestral wisdom. This is the best podcast on the internet. 
Kay Johnson 903, thank you so much for taking the time to leave this review. It really means a lot to us. And please feel free to rate and review the show as well. Help us get to that milestone of a thousand reviews. Thank you so much for listening. Stay well, my friend. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.